Derangements of Scale 1. Introduction Scale Effects Imagine this. You are lost in a small town, late for a vital appointment somewhere in its streets. You stop a friendly looking stranger and ask the way. Generously, he offers to give you a small map which he happens to have in his briefcase. The whole town is there, he says. You thank him and walk on, opening the map to pinpoint a route. It turns out to be a map of the whole earth. The wrong scale. A scale, from the Latin scala for ladder, step or stairs, usually enables a calibrated and useful extrapolation between dimensions of space or time. Thus, a cartographic scale describes the ratio of distance on a map to real distances on the Earth's surface. To move from a large to small scale, or vice versa, implies a calculable shift of resolution on the same area or features, a smooth zooming in or out. With climate change, however, we have a map, its scale includes the whole Earth, but when it comes to relating the threat to daily questions of politics, ethics, or specific interpretations of history, culture, literature, etc., the map is almost often mockingly useless. Policies and concepts relating to climate change invariably seem undermined, or even derided, by considerations of scale. A campaign for environmental reform in one country may be already effectively negated by the lack of such measures on the other side of the world. A long fought for nature reserve, designed to protect a rare ecosystem, becomes, zooming out, a different place. Even the climatology works on a less than helpful scale. Karen Litfin says, Paradoxically, it is simpler to predict what will happen to the planet, a closed system, and to make forecasts for specific regions. Cartographic scale is itself an inadequate concept here. Non-cartographic concepts of scale are not a smooth zooming in or out, but involve jumps and discontinuities with sometimes incalculable scale effects. For instance, G. Dowell, Ginoret and Django Wu observe that in the engineering sciences, scale effects are those that result from size differences between a model and the real system. Even though a miniature model of a building made of wood is structurally sound, it is not necessarily appropriate to infer that the same process maintaining structural stability could hold for a full-size building made of wood. To give another instance, a map of the whole Earth at a small scale in cartographic terms, is at an enormous scale ecologically, one at which other non-linear scale effects become decisive and sometimes incalculable. Garrett Harding writes, Many stupid actions taken by society could be avoided if more people were actually aware of scale effects. Whenever the scale is shifted upward, one should always be alert for possible contradictions of the conventional wisdom that served so well when the unit was rather smaller. The failure of the electorate to appreciate scale effects can put the survival of a democratic nation in jeopardy. Um, some thinkers less controversial than Hardin draw on complexity theory to suggest the necessary emergence of scale effects with mere, merely the increasing complexity of globalising civilization. That once a society develops beyond a certain level of complexity, it becomes increasingly fragile. Eventually, it may reach a point at which even a relatively minor disturbance can bring everything crashing down. For others, the environmental crisis is in part caused by the effects of conflicting scales in the government of human affairs. Um, Jim Data says, Environmental, economic, technological and health factors are global, but our governance systems are still based on the nation-state, while our economic systems, free market capitalism, and many national political systems, interest group democracy, remain profoundly individualistic in input.
albeit tragically collective in output. Scale effects in relation to climate change are confusing because they take the easy daily equations with moral and political accounting and drop into them both a zero and an infinity. The greater the number of people engaged in modern forms of consumption, then the less the relative influence or responsibility of each, but the worse the cumulative impact of that insignificance. As a result of scale effects, what is self-evident or rational on one scale may well be destructive or unjust at another. Hence, progressive social and economic policies designed to disseminate Western levels of prosperity may even resemble, on another scale, an insane plan to destroy the biosphere. Yet, for any individual household, motorist, etc., the scale effect in their actions is invisible. It is not present in any phenomenon in itself, but only in the contingency of how many other such phenomena there are, have been and will be at even vast distances of space or time. Human agency becomes, as it were, displaced from within by its own act, a kind of demonic iterability. The argument of this paper is that dominant modes of literary and cultural criticism are blind to scale effects in ways that now need to be addressed. Two, derangements of scale. One symptom of a now widespread crisis of scale is a derangement of linguistic and intellectual proportion in the way people often talk about the environment, a breakdown of decorum in the strict sense. Thus, a sentence about the possible collapse of civilization can end, no less solemnly, with the injunction never to fill a kettle more than necessary when making tea. A poster in many workplaces depicts the whole earth as a giant thermostat dial with the absurd but intelligible caption, you control climate change. A motorist buying a slightly less destructive make of car is now saving the planet. These deranged jumps in scale and fantasies of agency may recall rhetoric associated with the atomic bomb in the 1950s and after. Uh, Maurice Blanchot argued then that talk of humanity having power over the whole earth, or being able to destroy itself, was deeply misleading. Humanity is not some grand mega-subject or unitary agent in the sense this trope implies. In practice, such destruction would certainly not be some sort of consciously performed act of self-harm, humanity destroying itself. Blanchot writes that it would be as arbitrary as was the turtle that fell out of the sky and crushed the skull of Aeschylus. The almost nonsensical rhetoric of environmental slogans makes Blanchot's point even more forcedly. Received concepts of agency, rationality and responsibility are being strained, or even begin to fall apart, in the bewildering generalising of the political that could make even filling a kettle as public and actors voting. The very notion of a carbon footprint alters the distinctions of public and private built into the foundations of the modern liberal state. Normally, demands in the political context of face the future take the form of some rousing call to regain authenticity, whether personal, cultural or rational, and they reinforce given norms of morality or responsibility. With climate change, this seems not to be the case. Here, a barely calculable non-human agency brings about a general but unlocalised sense of delegitimation and uncertainty, the confusion of previously clear arenas of action or of concepts of equity. Boundaries between the scientific and the political become newly uncertain, <coughs> the distinction between the state and civil society less clear, and once normal procedures and modes of understanding begin to resemble dubious modes of political, ethical and intellectual containment. Even a great deal of environmental criticism, modelling itself on kinds of progressive oppositional politics and trying, like Murray Buchkin's 
social ecology to explain environmental degradation by reference solely to human to human oppressions can look like an evasion of the need to accord to the non-human a disconcerting agency of its own. <coughs> the environmental crisis also questions given boundaries between intellectual disciplines. The Daily News confirms repeatedly the impossibility of reducing many environmental issues to any one coherent problem, dysfunction or injustice. Overpopulation and atmospheric pollution, for instance, form social, moral, political, medical, technical, ethical and animal rights issues all at once. If that tired term, the environment, has often seemed too vague, for it means ultimately everything, yet the difficulty of conceptualising the politics of climate change may be precisely that of having to think everything at once. The overall force is of an implosion of scales implicating seemingly trivial or small actions with enormous stakes while the intellectual boundaries and lines of demarcation fold in upon each other. The inundation of received intellectual boundaries and the horror of many probable future scenarios has the deranging effect, for instance, of making deeply unsure which of the following two statements is finally the more responsible first statement. Climate change is now acknowledged as a legitimate and serious concern and the government will continue to support measures to improve the fuel efficiency of motor vehicles. Second statement. The only defensible relationship to have with any car is with a well-aimed brick. Three, contra-liberal criticism. How then can a literary or cultural critic engage with a sudden sense that most given thought about literature and culture has been taking place on the wrong scale? The most controversial political effect of climate change may be its challenge to basic dominant assumptions about the nature and seeming self-evident value of democracy as the most enlightened way to conduct human affairs. David Shearman and Joseph Wayne Smith write, Colossal environmental problems, both existing and impending, have been accelerated by the freedoms and corruption of democracy and are unlikely to be solved by this system of governance. The decisive target here is liberal democracy and the now dominant liberal tradition in political thought, that is, the tradition which combines institutions of private property market-based economics, individualistic rights-based notions of personhood and the conception of the state as existing to secure the freedom of individuals on a formally egalitarian basis. The liberal political tradition, looking back to Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, sees politics as essentially a matter of compacts between individuals for the unmolested use of individual property and exploitation of natural resources. Such conceptions of right seem at first merely neutral. The rights that apply to a hundred people or to a hundred million could surely also apply to billions. Some questions about scale, however, emerge when it is remembered that the founding conceptions of the liberal tradition emerged in the 17th and 18th centuries in low population density and low technology societies with seemingly unlimited access to land and other resources in a world, that is, which is now being consumed. On top of this, as Stephen Ross observes, Locke takes it for granted that there will be enough, that the goodness of things provides enough, so that taking by one or a group does not deprive others. But structurally committed to a process of continuous economic growth, modern Western society effectively projected as its material condition an ever-expandable frontier of new land or resources. This impossible demand of assumption, disguised by the free gift of fossil fuels, has now become visible and problematic. What Hans Jonas writes of all traditional ethics applies here. It reckoned only with non-cumulative behaviour. <coughs>
liberal notions of extending the status of the rights-bearing individual to more and more people are caught up in a complex and bewildering economy of violence. Climate change disrupts the scale at which one must think, skews categories of internal and external, and resists inherited closed economies of accounting or explanation in a way that even Jacques Derrida seems not to have suspected or anticipated. Referring to Derrida's well-known account in his Spectres of Marx, 1993, of the ten plagues held to be threatening the world, Tom Cohen writes that there is a puzzling absence of any reference to environmental crisis, arguably the most serious plague of all. Cohen says, Derrida's manoeuvre looks weak today, all ten being fairly standard and all human to human political miseries, from worklessness to weak international law. Today, as we know, the entire game board has been invisibly haunted by its own drive to auto-erase or auto-eviscerate the non-anthropic premises. True Derrida rights of incalculable responsibility and the conceptual and physical destabilisation of borders, of national frontiers and the destabilising in general of the at home. His small book on hospitality from 2000 argued how the supposedly inviolable interiority of the home is already deconstituted, turned inside out, by its multiple embeddings in public space, the state, the telephone line, monitored emails and so on. Yet there is still a residual idealism in Derrida's exclusive attention to systems of law and communication. His focus on the moment of decision in individual consciousness and its pathos, its ordeal of undecidability and so on, may seem narrow and inadequate in a context in which things have now become overwhelmingly more political than people. Nothing in his work seems to allow for a situation in which it is not irrational to connect a patio heater in London immediately with the slow inundation of Tuvalu in the Pacific. Thus, on hospitality mentions TV, email and internet, but not the central heating system, cooking appliances, washing machine or car. Uh, Graham Harmon's aphorism surely applies here. All reality is politics, but not all politics is human. Wendy Brown argues that Derrida's treatment of freedom reveals the hold of liberalism on his formulations of democracy, that his arguments still work within an essentially liberal conception of politics as devising systems to enable the space of individuals seeming freedom to live as they choose, the challenge being to extend such politics beyond current borders and even beyond an exclusively human reference. The issue for me is that Derrida's reconfigured notion of subjectivity as openness to the other instead of an autonomous self-presence and his attention to a poor years of freedom and equality and conditional and unconditional hospitality do not alter the basic terms of Derrida's commitment to a liberal progressivist tradition whose assumptions of scale are here at issue. In support of Brown's point about the uncritical hold of liberalism on Derrida's thought, one can argue the seeming blindness to non-human agency and to scale effects still tends to preserve the political in on hospitality as a factitiously separate sphere. Yet environmental issues enact a bewildering generalisation of the political that makes Derrida's focus on human norms, institutions and decisions begin to look like a kind of containment. His conception of the moment of decision as a negotiation with the undecidable is simultaneously both trivialised and magnified by scale effects in relation to such minutiae as turning a light on or deciding to buy a freezer. The later Derrida's frontier questions of conditional or unconditional hospitality can seem foreclosed in scale, two-dimensional, they ignore that ubiquitous border already contiguous with all other countries at the same time, a shared atmosphere.
To live the hourly trivia of an affluent lifestyle in France is already to lurk as a destructive interloper in the living space of a farmer on the massive flood plains of Bangladesh. A non-human politics also raises questions about the dominant liberal progressive cultural politics of much mainstream professional literary criticism. The frequent method now is to read all issues as forms of cultural politics with an understanding of the text analogous to the way the liberal tradition sees civic society generally. That is, as an arena for the contestation of individual or collective interests, rights or identity claims. For example, Group A is seen to achieve its self-celebratory image through its implicit denigration of Group B, while Group C sees itself as marginalised by the way Group B always seems to identify it with Group A, instead of being a dis distinct set with its own claims, and so on. Yet each, as we know, at the same time is taking its own rights to air, water, space, material resources, and so on, and to focus solely on the rights of individual persons or groups elides the issue of the violence continually and problematically being waged against the earth itself, whose own agency is both taken for granted and disregarded. In sum, it is as if critics were writing on a flat and passive earth of indefinite extension, not a round active one whose furthest distance comes from behind to tap you uncomfortably on the shoulder. Modes of thinking and practice that may once have seemed justified, internally coherent, self-evident or progressive, now need to be reassessed in terms of hidden exclusions, disguised costs, or was offering a merely imaginary or temporary closure. How this will work out in practice, however, is harder to predict. Four, reading Raymond Carver's Elephant on a scale of six centuries. In what ways are inherited and currently dominant modes of reading in literary and cultural criticism blind to questions of scale? The issue can be tested through a practical reading experiment. How would it be to read and reread the same text through a series of increasingly broad spatial and temporal scales, one after the other, paying particular attention to the strain this puts on given critical assumptions and currently dominant modes of reading. Let us turn to a specific example. Raymond Carver's late short story, Elephant, from 1988. This text is a comic monologue consisting of the complaints and then gradual acceptance of a male blue-collar worker somewhere in the United States who is continually being pestered for money by hard-pressed relatives in other parts of the country. Most of Elephant happens between domestic interiors linked by telephone. The narrator's recently unemployed brother, a thousand miles away in California, requiring immediate help to help pay the mortgage on his house, seems later to be able to forego more borrowing because his wife might sell some land in her family but then comes back asking for money once again. This brother has already had to sell the family's second car and pawn the TV. The narrator's daughter has two children and is married to a swine who won't even look for work, a guy who couldn't hold a job if they handed him one. The time or two he did find something, he overslept, or his car broke down on the way to work or we'd just be let go. No explanation, and that was that. The narrator's aged mother, described as poor and greedy, relies on the support of both her sons to maintain her independent lifestyle amid signs of failing health. The narrator's son demands money to enable him to emigrate to Germany, and a divorced wife has to be paid alimony. Struggling with his resentment as he writes all the checks, the narrator reaches a turning point with two dreams, one of them being about how his father used to carry him on his shoulders when he was a child, and he would feel safe, stretch out his arms, and fantasise that he was riding an elephant. 
The next morning, giving a kind of private blessing to all his relatives, despite their demands, he decides to walk rather than drive to work, leaving his house unlocked. Walking along the road, he is stretching out his arms, as in his dream of childhood, when a workmate calls George, stops his car to pick him up. George has a cigar and has just borrowed money to improve his car. Together they test it for speed. Elephant ends as follows. Go, I said. What are you waiting for, George? And that's when we really flew. Wind howled outside the windows. He had it floored and we were going flat out. We streaked down that road in his big, unpaid-for car. With the new questions posed by climate change in mind, what kind of readings emerge of such a text? Firstly, perhaps, that if capitalism must be regarded as an economy of unpaid costs, as according to K. William Knapp, then Elephant can easily be read as a kind of environmental allegory, as a narrative of a chain of unpaid debt and unearned support extending itself into the final image of the large unpaid-for car. This relatively obvious first reading, however, can be deepened by considerations of scale. Any broadly mimetic interpretation of a text, mapping it onto different, if hopefully illuminating, terms, always assumes a physical and temporal scale of some sort. It is a precondition of any such mapping, though almost never explicit in the interpretation. The scale in which one reads a text drastically alters the kinds of significance attached to elements of it, but as we shall see, it cannot itself give criteria for judgment. Three scales can be used. First, we could read the text on a critically naive personal scale that takes into account only the narrator's immediate circle of family and acquaintance over a time scale of several years. At this scale, there is a certain humanist cosiness about the text, as if the Carver story were already a commercial screenplay. Family loyalty wins out against misfortune, love and forgiveness prevail in a tale of minor but genuine domestic heroism. This reading could refer to Carver's defence of the short story as throwing some light on what it is that makes and keeps us, often against great odds, recognisably human. In this respect, Elephant would even come close to being a kind of Carver schmaltz. The second scale is that almost always assumed in literary criticism. Spatially, it is that of a national culture and its inhabitants, with a time frame of perhaps a few decades, a historical period of some kind. Almost all criticism of Carver is situated at this scale, placing his work in the cultural context of the late 20th century United States, or sometimes in the broader scale of the modern short story after Edgar Allan Poe. Kirk Nessert, writing in 1995, is representative he says, Carver's figures dramatise and indirectly comment upon the problems besetting American culture, particularly lower middle class culture, today. Other topics prominent in discussions of Carver are broadly located at this scale, such as unemployment and consumer culture as they affect personal relationships, the ideals and realities of American domesticity, that society's materialism, and its concepts of gender, especially masculinity. This scale enables an interpretation of the final scene of Elephant as an affirmative but temporary moment of escape from the denigrations and frustrations of American consumer capitalism, focused on the private car as an image of individual freedom and nobility. The third hypothetical scale is of course the difficult one, it could be spatially that of the whole earth and its inhabitants, placing elephant in the middle of, let us say, a 600-year time frame, that is, 
from 300 years before 1988 to 2288, 300 years after, and bearing in mind plausible scenarios for the habitability of the planet at that later time. What does this do? An initial impulse is that trying to read elephant at this scale simply does not make sense. It seems deliberately to repeat the kind of derangements of scale familiar in environmental slogans, eat less meat and save the earth. At the same time, the feeling of paralysis or arbitrariness in the experiment cannot override the conviction that to read at scales that used familiarly to make sense may now also be forms of intellectual and ethical containment. What then is being held off? Viewed on very long time scales, human history and culture can take on unfamiliar shapes as work in environmental history repeatedly demonstrates, altering conceptions of what makes something important and what does not. Non-human entities take on a decisive agency. Thus, some would argue that globally, the two major events of the past three centuries have been the industrial exploitation of fossil fuels and the worldwide supplanting of local biota in favour of an imported set of commercially profitable species – cattle, wheat, sheep, maize, sugar, coffee, eucalyptus, palm oil and so on. Thus it is that most of the world's wheat, a crop originally from the Middle East, now comes from other areas – Canada, the United States, Argentina, Australia – just as people of originally European origin now dominate a large proportion of the Earth's surface. This huge shift in human populations including slaves, as well as domesticated animals and plants, has largely determined the modern world, with its close connections between destructive monocultures in food production, exploitative, exploitative systems of international trade and exchange, and the institution of the modern state. At its bleakest, an ecological overview of the current state of the planet may show a huge bubble of population and consumption in one species intensifying exponentially and expanding at a rate that cannot be supported by the planet's resources for long. It is the transitory world of this bizarre, destructive and temporary energy imbalance that Western populations currently inhabit and take for a stable and familiar reality. One element of containment in lower scale readings of elephant, blind to this bigger reality, is the methodological nationalism of readings located at the middle scale. Methodological nationalism is a term taken from A.D. Smith and used by Ulrich Bech. It names the fact that we often think, interpret and judge as if the territorial boundaries of the nation-state acted as a self-evident principle of overall coherence and intelligibility within which a history and culture can be understood ignoring anything that does not fit such a narrative. After all, literary criticism itself evolved primarily as an institution of cultural self-definition at this scale. Almost all criticism of Carver could be instanced here. Even so seemingly innocent a phrase as Carver's the dark side of Reagan's America can instantiate methodological nationalism in proportion to the degree in which the national sphere and its cultural agenda serve exclusively to inframe, contain and shape an analysis, or the familiar but contained critics' judgments about social inclusion or exclusion. The expanded scale, however, makes familiar critical assumptions about the adequacy of a national context look parochial. What happens if one deploys, at the third global scale, the methodology of mainstream cultural criticism with its broadly liberal progressive agenda and questions of equity, those top eye of exclusion and inclusion? The rhetoric of marginalisation and impoverishment common in readings of Carver becomes, at the very least, complicated by the fact that, on a global scale, that while their distress is undeniable, none of the characters in Elephant is actually poor, 
in a material sense. The narrator has a house to himself, also a car. The supposedly impoverished brother had two cars and was forced to sell one of them to help keep his house. The supposedly poverty-stricken daughter, with her husband and children, lives in a trailer that has at least one car. The brother's wife is a landowner and the son requires money to do something most living people will never do, travel in an aeroplane to another country. The mother does not live with any of her children, it is maintained in a household of her own. It is not then the number of people, but the number of separate households demanding support that is the real economic issue in Elephant, the keeping of the property each represents. The culture of independence affirmed in the narrator's indignant work ethic effectively serves economic and infrastructure systems that set up a continuous dependency on high levels of consumption and, as a result, produce a pervasive and intensifying sense of entrapment. If nothing succeeds like success, nothing also entraps like success, hence Jonas. Derrida argued how the supposedly self-contained inner realm of the at-home, the house, the personal household, is constitutively breached by its embeddedness in public space. It is very set up repeated liberal conceptions of politics, even if it complicated them. At the third scale, however, everything and everyone is always outside. A person registers there less in terms of familiar social coordinates, race, class, gender and so on, than as a physical entity representing so much consumption of resources and expenditure of waste. Not the personality, but the footprint. The effect of embedding elephant within the third scale is to turn the text into a peculiar kind of gothic, a doppelganger narrative. Characters as persons and responsible agents are now doubled by themselves as mere physical entities. The larger the scale, the more thing-like becomes the significance of the person registered on it, even as scale effects have given human beings the status now of a geological force. Plots, characters, setting and trivia that seem normal and harmless on the personal or national scale appear as destructive doubles of themselves on the third scale, part of a disturbing and encroaching parallel universe whose malign reality is becoming impossible to deny. It becomes impossible to sustain the fiction that a significant historical agency is the preserve of human beings alone. The material infrastructure that surrounds and largely dictates the lives of the people, the houses, the cars, the roads, may partially displace more familiar issues of identity and cultural representation as a focus of significance. Technology and infrastructures emerge not only as inherently political, but as unpredictably doubly politicised in scale effects that deride the intentions of their users or builders. Elephant could thus be described in terms of what William Ophels calls energy slavery. The oppressive, all-pervading and destructive effects of being born into a fossil fuel-based infrastructure as aggressive as an occupying army. A future reading of Elephant would thus be more object oriented, aware of the capricious nature of non-human agency and suspicious of the way contemporary criticism, even eco-criticism, tends to interiorise all environmental issues as ultimately questions of subjective attitudes or belief of humanity acting reflexively upon itself even to destroy itself. For instance, there is nothing really private about a car, just as, ironically, the average person's decisions to fill or not fill a kettle will almost certainly be of more real consequence, however minuscule, than their political opinions ever will. In Elephant, along with the households demanding to be sustained, the politics of energy slavery reappear even, even, even in such seemingly daily trivia as how the daughter's partner allegedly lost the chance of a job because his car broke down, or the way the narrator's brother promises, I've got this job lined up, it's definite, 
I'll have to drive 50 miles round trip every day, but that's no problem. Hell no, I'd drive 150 if I had to. Cars also proliferate themselves through the parasitism of ideologies of individual freedom. Elephant ends with the narrator in the passenger seat on a high of speed, urging on George, complete with a cigar, to drive as fast as he possibly can. To highlight non-human agency adds a missing dimension to such familiar critical themes in reading Carver as the erosion of communal values or to the social cultural force of Carver's so-called minimalism in short story technique, its projection of a late capitalist society of disjunctive surfaces and personal isolation in which the lack of a completely reliable sense of relation between cause and effect, intention and result, effort and reward, is accompanied by a pervading sense of insecurity. The future all reading further decenters human agency, underlining the fragility and contingency of effective boundaries between public and private, objects and persons, the seemingly innocent and the seemingly guilty, human history and natural history, the traumatic and the banal, and, with technology, the convenient and the disenfranchising. In some at the third scale, a kind of non-anthropic irony deranges the short story as any easily assimilable object of any given kind of moral stroke political reading. Simon Levin writes that there is no single correct scale or level at which to describe a system, but this does not mean that all scales serve equally well or that there are not scaling laws. However, I think there are crucial differences between reading a literary text at multiple scales and the function of scales in scientific modelling and explanation. In such modelling, suppression of detail is seen as a strength of work at large scales, where broad patterns can emerge overriding individual variation. A literary reading, though, clearly works in no such way. Assumptions of scale are always at work in any reading, but these may enable different judgments of value, not decide them. Three scales produce readings of elephant that conflict with each other, yet, one asks, can the third scale act as some final frame of reference or court of last appeal deciding for us how to read the text? An ecological overview is surely in danger of feeding a reductive but increasingly familiar green moralism, keen to turn ecological facts into moral imperatives on how to live, blind to the sense of helplessness dominant in elephant at the first scale. While it highlights the hidden costs of low, lower scale thinking, the third scale's tendency to register a person primarily as a physical thing is evidently problematic, almost too brutally removed from the daily interpersonal ethics, hopes and struggles that it ironises. For instance, although this essay chose the less controversial example of cars, the most environmentally significant aspect of the situation in the text would be the reproduction of people themselves. The fact that the narrator has fathered two children would be more crucial in brutal terms of physical emissions than either his lifestyle or property. This highlights an issue over population which reduces even Donna Haraway to contradiction, or more strictly, to thinking on conflicting scales at the same time. Speaking, she says, as a biologist, and in the face of a planet that's got well over six million people, six billion people, excuse me, she says, the carrying capacity of the planet probably isn't that, and I don't care how many times you talk about the regressive nature of anti-natalist ideologies and population control ideologies. All true. But without serious population reduction, we aren't going to make it as a species and neither are thousands or millions of other species. So, you can hate the Chinese for the one-child policy and also think they are right. Laughs. In some, 
Reading at several scales at once cannot be just the abolition of one scale in the greater claim of another, but a way of enriching, singularizing, it also creatively deranging the text through embedding it in multiple and even contradictory frames at the same time. So that even the most enlightened seeming progressive social argument may have one in agreement on one scale and reaching for a conceptual brick on another. The overall interpretation of elephant offered here can only be a multiple self-conflictual one. The acts of the narrator remain ones of great personal generosity, even if, at the same time, scale effects ironically implicate them in incalculable evil. The text emerges simultaneously, depending on the scale at issue, as 1. A wry anecdote of personal heroism, 2. A protest against social exclusion, and 3. A confrontation with the entrapment of human actions and decisions within a disastrous interpersonal dynam impersonal dynamic they do not comprehend, as well as the various containments of inherited modes of thinking. A further conclusion seems clear. Thinking of climate change in relation to literary or cultural criticism will not be a matter of inventing some new method of reading per se, for its most prominent effect is of a derangement of scales it is also an implosion of intellectual competences. It is far easier for critics to stay inside the professionally familiar circle of cultural representations, ideas, prejudices and so on, than to engage with long-term relations of physical cause and effect or the environmental costs of an infrastructure, questions that involve non-human agency and which engage modes of expertise that may lie outside the humanities altogether. This would also suggest that the humanities, as currently constituted, make up forms of ideological containment that may now need to change. <laughs>